Hello, and welcome to my review of the Dark Sword Armory Fantasy Templar Helmet. The Fantasy Templar Helmet is a helmet inspired by the Knights Templar and the Crusades, but it's also a historically accurate representation of a great helm that was uh, reached its peak in the 14th century, both from a point of view of its design and uh, the protection it provided. But we can't speak about a helmet called a fantasy Templar helm without speaking a little bit about the Knights Templar. So who were the Knights Templar? Following the First Crusade, the Holy Land was a dangerous place to travel. And a group of nine knights suggested to King Baldwin of Jerusalem that they establish a monastic order to protect pilgrims. Baldwin granted their request and they became the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, or more commonly, the Templars. The Templars played a key role not only in the Crusades, but in military, political, religious, farming, financial affairs of the period for quite a while, until they fell out of disfavor with a number of the kings of Europe and the church. But that's another story for a different time. The Templars are definitely one of the most famous military formidable and mythologized organization of the Middle Ages. And in fact, they continue to entertain us and captivate us in modern times, entertainment, and games. The Great Helm, or home, was in use in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries, and saw many improvements in its form and design, as you might expect for uh, a piece of equipment which was around for multiple centuries. The helmet uh, started off with a flat top, much like the one over my right shoulder here, but that design was very susceptible to blows being struck on the top of the head, which might not penetrate the helmet, but the force of the blow could definitely damage the head, the neck, and even down through the shoulders. So it wasn't an optimal design. And over time, the top of the helmet changed to either rounded or conical shapes, which were much more effective at deflecting the force of blows. In addition, the face protection began to change over time. You know, the original arming caps had no face protection. A nasal piece was then added. And then face plates began to be common. But that also continued to improve in a number of different ways. They became longer and provided more protection coming down through the uh, front of the neck. And in addition, they began to move a little bit further away from the face. That did a couple of things. These helmets are heavy. They're uh, maybe even a little claustrophobic when you're, when you're wearing them, but heat also builds up in them quite a bit and ventilation becomes a bit of a problem. Moving the helmet a little bit further out provided for a better uh, ventilation and it provided uh, a better means for that heat to be uh, dissipated. These uh, holes in the uh, faceplate here called breeze also played a key role in uh, dissipating heat and making it easier to breathe. And as you're exerting yourself, you can imagine it was probably quite difficult. In most of the helmets of uh, this period, the breeze or ventilation pieces are on the right side of the helmet. And this one has no ventilation on the left. Some had fewer spots, but that was mainly because in a right-handed, uh, predominantly right-handed world, the blows were coming in on that side of the helmet. The extra rigidity and protection provided from not having the holes could be more effective. In addition, jousting and the way jousts were set up, that's the angle at which most uh, uh, lances would be coming at the head as well. Uh, as you can see, this would provide much additional protection. The next step was the adding of uh, plates in the back of the helmet and again, them becoming uh, longer. In, when you look at this helmet, the uh, plates at the back for protection would come right down to the bottom of the neck and provide uh, protection all around uh, the entire head. So 
As we can see, the helmet uh, was definitely something which uh, saw a change over a period of time to where it got to this, which was really the epitome of uh, the great helm and uh, its evolution through nearly three centuries of uh, youth. The helmet itself would uh, generally be worn over a cloth arming cap and even chain mail. And that would help to give the helmet uh, a little bit more secure feel. But even with that, there were still uh, many uh, shortcomings with a helmet like this. It's really hard to see, very narrow eye slits. It's very hard to maneuver. And as I said earlier, uh, they are hot and uh, it's hard to breathe in there as well. These would stay in use to uh, definitely through the uh, 14th century until they were replaced from, uh, from a day-to-day -day battle perspective with uh, bassinets in their various forms. And they did uh, last uh, quite a bit longer, but continued to evolve with uh, the uh, fog mouth type of helmet, which became uh, more commonplace in jousting and was used well into the uh, 16th century. When uh, we look at uh, the Templar fantasy helm, it is uh, made from 18 gauge steel. It uh, is, uh, comes blackened in uh, the interior and that's to cut down on maintenance. And it also has a leather suspension system to adjust it to uh, the right height for you or for your stand, as well as a uh, chin strap to uh, adjust it and, uh, and wear it securely on your head. I could uh, go on about the helm a little bit more, just saying that it is constructed from four pieces, the top cone, the piece around it, the front piece, the back piece. It's held in place by uh, rivets. The rivets are all tight, very nicely done, all rounded, quite decorative as well on the helmet. If you're looking for something that uh, definitely strikes of uh, a Templar and a Templar usage, or if you're just looking for a really good example of a great helm to be in your collection, this would, uh, would definitely be a suitable piece for you. Thank you very much.